Hi, and welcome to a new series of conversations from the Composer Wellbeing Collective. The Composer Wellbeing Collective is a newly formed non-commercial initiative committed to raising awareness and increasing impartial support for the well-being of composers and music creators with a focus on positive conversation around mental well-being. Check out the Composer Wellbeing Collective website, Instagram and Twitter, Twitter pages for details of the next conversation. And please do get in touch. We would love to hear from you. Every voice helps open up the conversation around composer well-being. We're starting this series with a mini series of conversations with Professor Roger Kneebone, who has been described as an expert on experts due to his research into interdisciplinary skills. Today's topic is performance pressure within composition, music creators and other experts. And I'd also like to welcome composers Hannah Peel and Ollie Howell. Um, shall we start with a quick introduction um, from each of you? Um, shall we start with Roger? Yes, well, hello everybody. Very, very, very nice to be here. Um, yes, sh shall I give you a brief, a brief background of, of my, my sort of career so far, which has gone in peculiar directions. So I've got a medical background, trained initially as a, as a surgeon, a trauma surgeon particularly. Um, and for the first phase of my career, I spent quite a few years in Southern Africa uh, and, and this country too, uh, doing a lot of operating. Uh, and then I changed direction completely and I became uh, a GP, a family doctor. And for the next almost 20 years, 17 I think, I was working in a seven doctor practice in Trowbridge, about 100 miles from London in the southwest of England. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in um, 2000, I changed direction again and I became an academic, joined Imperial College London, one of the big London universities, which is where I'm working at the moment. Um, and, and since then, I've developed a series of interests, really, around, um, well, more recently, they've been looking at medicine and surgery, not only as, um, as sites of the acquisition and application of scientific knowledge, but as sites of performance, particularly, and of craftsmanship. And I've become increasingly interested in what it is to become expert in fields like performance um, and looking at what might be the common ground between different kinds of performers. So I've done a lot of work with, um, with medical people, of course, in my own area, but also I jointly lead the Centre for Performance Science between the Imperial College, where I am, and the Royal College of Music next door. So I've had a, a, a lot of opportunities with my with my colleague and co-director Aaron Williamson to work with musicians, but also a number of other performers. We've been uh, we've got a number of residents, artists in residence, a magician, a puppeteer, um, a combat pilot, uh, a, a chef, a medical illustrator, um, and a and an embroiderer, for example. And all those people have been fascinating in uh, in in looking at different worlds of performance through a series of lenses. Um, and so one of the things I'm particularly interested in, one of the reasons that um, I first uh, became aware of Ollie's work, for instance, was, was when I um, went to one of his performances when he just released his, um, his CD, Sutures and Stitches. Um, and it seemed to me that, that Ollie's work crossed these disciplinary boundaries in his case, in his case, bringing his own personal experience, which I'm sure he'll say more about, uh, of, of brain surgery um, around music and my interest of looking at music as an instance of performance have led to a series of conversations. And, and I guess that's one of the things I'm particularly interested in in the Composers Wellbeing Collective is, is how we might look from different perspectives at the world, say, of music and the world of medicine. And, and, and I hope identify areas of common ground that you might not immediately think of but that, 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 that have been there all the time. Great that's I mean that's given us so much to talk about already. <laughs> um, Hannah would you like to just intro yourself really quickly? Yes hello everybody it's lovely to be here. Um, uh, I guess it's harder to talk about yourself <laughs> sometimes when it's music related. Um, I began work as a session musician when I graduated from university um, and toured a lot for a long time and then began to do my own records as an artist. Um, I was still composing things for little bits of short film and theatre but mostly it was 
releasing records and uh, one of those records was called Awake But Always Dreaming and that was mainly focused on my grandmother because she was in the final stages of dementia at that point so there was a, a definite kind of um, curve into learning about music and how that works with the brain and neurons and just fascinated that she could sing a Christmas carol but not remember anything else and that began a whole kind of journey where with quite a few scientists at UCL um, and a lot of work and a lot of talking with Alzheimer's Research UK and opened a door into a world of music and science that I never actually thought I would go into but the world itself just kind of came <laughs> so um, and that led on to doing more kind of I suppose more fantastical sort of things so I did an album called Mary Cassio Journey to Cassiopeia uh, that was with synthesizers and a colliery brass band and that was all about the journey of this lady Mary Cassio and and her mission to go into space but by the end of the the album you hear a track that kind of brings you back down to earth and you realize that it was probably all in her memory um and so there was, so there's definitely been a, a journey there, but since then I've ended up, I wrote some music for a Game of Thrones documentary um, and was lucky enough to be nominated for an Emmy. So, and ever since then, I've just kind of been bombarded with lots of TV and film work and loved it. Um, so I guess there's another journey that's happening there right now. So. Thanks. Um, and Ollie, over to you. And maybe you could um, lead into how your relationship with uh, Roger started and your, um, your, your collaboration. Sure. Well, if you think it's intimidating to talk about yourself, try introducing yourself after you two. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Ollie Howe. Um, part of what I do, like Hannah, is an artist. So I'm a jazz drummer, jazz musician. Uh, and I've had two records out and done lots of touring with those. Uh, the first one, Sutures and Stitches, as Roger mentioned, um, I wrote kind of unexpectedly whilst I was at music college and I was very suddenly diagnosed with a brain malformation and I had to go and have several uh, neurosurgeries to, to deal with that. And at that point I was just a drummer as in didn't do any composition or never even thought about composition. And um, because I was just sat on hospital bed for so long, so many months, all I had was like some paper and my, my computer that had Sibelius on it. So um, I just wrote music and it turned into an album very, very unexpectedly. And that kind of, launched my artist career um, so that's part of what I do um, as a jazz drummer and then I'm also a composer of film and tv um, mostly film at the moment but I've worked across uh, various different genres I'm working on my second feature at the moment um, and I also work with a lot of other composers either collaboratively or as an assistant doing additional writing and uh, synth programming and orchestrating all sorts of bits and bobs um, and I'm also a founding member of this composer wellbeing collective um, and so as I say yeah this album first album I wrote was called Sutures and Stitches um, and Roger I guess just saw the title and we were having a launch at uh, King's Place in London and he came along and we started chatting afterwards and I having just been through that experience of having neurosurgery um, and trying to learn very very quickly all about the brain he's kind of said would you be interested in doing some research and looking at ways we can do something together. And I, of course, said yes. Um, and after various uh, kind of conversations and meetups, uh, he suggested that we do some sort of performance-based thing, because as, as Roger said, he does a lot of work into performance. So uh, we partnered with the London Jazz Festival and Jez Nelson at the Cockpit Theatre in London, which is a theatre in the round. And we did this completely weird and bizarre performance, jazz surgery performance, which involved me performing with my band and another amazing pianist called Liam Noble doing an improvisation and then Roger and a team of of very real brain surgeons and experts in that field came and did this incredible uh, surgical demonstration with a again very realistic looking mannequin having one of the surgeries that I've already had which we then was then kind of on display for everyone to see and to talk about and then we had a panel discussion and uh, then Liam and I did a kind of joint improvisation at the end. It was by far the most surreal experience of my life, partly also because I think it was like an hour before we were going to go into the show and Roger said, I've had a really good idea. Do you want to be a scrub nurse in the operation 
thing. So I was there in scrubs, like holding back this bit of skin on a mannequin, thinking that was me two years ago, and then getting up and playing the drums afterwards. So it was, it was completely humbling and weird and wonderful and something I 100% will never forget. Yeah, that's mental. <laughs> a very meta experience for you, something that probably not a lot of people would ever really <laughs> experience their own surgery in a performance setting. <laughs> um, so Roger, what was your experience of this? What, 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 was this what, was, what were you hoping to get out of this collaboration with Ollie? Well, I didn't really know to begin with. I, I, I just thought it would be an interesting thing. I mean, I was like jazz and, and I was very impressed when I went and saw Ollie's performance at, at that first, that first um, concert at, at King's Place. Um, but I've also been very interested in what happens when you have conversations with people without quite knowing where they're going to go and, and people you, you, you sort of kind of think you might hit it off with and, and just see where things go. And then this idea sort of evolved and I, I invited one of my colleagues at Imperial, Professor Mark Wilson, who's a, who's a professor of neurotrauma. So he's a brain surgeon who deals with people who've largely had injuries, but of course all these other things. And, and it just occurred to me that it would be really interesting to look at these two kinds of performance at the same time and maybe shake up the audience at the London Jazz Festival just a little bit because <laughs> I don't think they really knew quite what to expect. Um, rather to my surprise, when I mooted this at the cockpit, Jez Nelson and his, his colleague Dave Wiper, I immediately thought this sounded a really good idea. So I thought that's a good start. Um, Ollie was on board and so we, we rather, um, it, was, it was a little bit tense because Mark Wilson, the neurosurgeon, was having to deal with, with quite a lot of seriously Ill, injured patients at the time. So we weren't quite sure until the last moment whether he'd actually make it or whether he'd have to be operating, but he did make it. And so there was a, quite a strong sort of improvisational uh, flavour to the whole thing, really. Um, and we had no idea how it would go down with the audience. And we were, we were putting on this operation with a pretty realistic mannequin draped with surgical instruments, as, as Ollie said, in the middle of this theatre in the round with a, with a projection showing what was happening. Uh, and, and then there was Ollie sort of holding instruments for this procedure that he himself had undergone. So there were many, many levels of things. And we weren't quite sure whether people were going to go green and, um, and, and feel faint or, uh, or what. <laughs> um, and it was bookmarked by these, these, these extraordinary performances by, by Ollie and his band and by Liam Noble, the pianist, as I said. So, so it was really a, a mixture of, of genres. Um, and then, of course, there was the unknown quantity of the audience and how they'd respond and the kind of questions they might ask and, and things. Um, but it did seem to me that it had a strong element of improvisation, but that didn't seem a big surprise to me because certainly as a trauma surgeon, for instance, there's a very strong element of improvisation. You, you know, pretty much the only thing you can tell for certain uh, in an operation like that when somebody's been stabbed or shot or, or blown up or run over or, or any of those things uh, is that you can't know for certain what you're going to find until you start. Um, and you have a general idea of, of, of what it's going to be because you know, you know what organs people have inside them, but you certainly don't know what injuries you're going to find or, or what, are the, what are going to be the, the characteristics of that individual patient. And I guess it's like that with musical performances too, because there's, there's, there must always be an awful lot of stuff that you can't know for certain before you start. I mean, the audience, apart from anything else. And in a performance like this one, there was even more that we didn't know because there was the surgery in the middle of a jazz concert uh, part of it. Um, and, and so I thought what was really interesting was the way everybody came together. Um, and Ollie, I know there was a lot of, uh, uh, there was quite a lot of stuff that you didn't really know what was going to happen any more than the rest of us did. But it, it kind of worked, didn't it? I think so. I mean, yeah, there were definitely audience members that were not expecting that and definitely did go green, but they stayed. So I guess it was interesting. Mm. I mean, it was, it was incredibly fascinating for me because I, until having met you, I had never even thought of surgery as performance and let alone improvisation and obviously like we as media composers I mean I'd be interested to hear how Hannah does it but I, I know I improvise a lot while I'm writing improvised picture and stuff so it's it's very much part of everything I do and I just never put the connection that the other kind of I suppose non non obviously creative areas of, of work improvise and kind of rely on that so heavily and from hearing you talk about 
being a trauma surgeon and how you just it's all the things about learned muscle memory and almost like telepathic communication between each other it's exactly the same as we all deal with but i just had never put two and two together yeah sorry go ahead roger <laughs> so no i was just going to say that 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 uh, i mean I, I imagine it's very different in your world but in my world of medicine improvisation it kind of has a bit of a bad name in some ways because people people often think oh improvisation it's just you know putting things together on the hoof because you you couldn't be bothered to to to, to do it properly kind of thing but i think absolutely the reverse i think improvisation the ability to improvise is a very high form of art and it's something that you only get after a lot of study and a lot of time um, and an awful lot of, of, of concentrated effort for many, many years to be able to do that. And I think when we were looking at that, at that concert in the, in the cockpit, we had two examples of musical improvisation. And indeed, as Ollie says, we ended up with Ollie and just Ollie, not his band, and Liam Noble, the pianist, improvising from different from you know opposite ends of the stage for maybe only five minutes at the end but that was a really powerful experience because it, you could see them both concentrating completely on one another and what was taking shape between them uh, as they were playing and it seemed to me that that is a sort of essence of um, of performance and I, I guess it is probably an essence of composing too i mean i don't know if hannah would like to because i know you do all sorts of you do all sorts of things w w with with stuff that i imagine you're not uh, uh, you know you're bringing together all kinds of different instruments and, and approaches and things and there must be an improvisational element to that i imagine yeah there's there's definitely a kind of i guess the gut reaction initially is the the thing that drives you so um because we were talking about film and tv and ollie mentioned it i guess when you first see a film and those first reactions are always the most instinctive and the most improvised and it's usually that melody or that chord or that feeling or that sound that sticks throughout and um like especially if i'm working and you're to a deadline that's the most important element like you you don't have time to kind of like um, set aside things. So that improv improvisation side of it is is unique in itself because it brings out things that you wouldn't normally do. And I guess the same when you've got pressure and you've got someone in front of you when you're operating on that pressure to kind of, it all kicks in, doesn't it? The instincts to like go, right, I'm going to use this, and I'm going to use that, and I'm going to use that. And you can't do that if you've not experienced certain things. Um, like or chord structures or you know exactly what instrument you're going to use what be it in science or music um someone once asked me if there was a difference between a scientist and a and, and a creator or a musician and i said there wasn't because equally you have to be creative you've got to think on the spot you've got a, the exploratory side of you has got to find something that's there that can be fixed or can be used and um I think that's really fascinating, especially when I mentioned about the Awake But Always Dreaming album and I was working with the scientist and she was making um, brain neurons in Petri dishes and just that kind of uniqueness and knowing that to study the brains, you, the brain cells, you would be looking at a Petri dish and growing it yourself. And I just think that it's just fascinating. It's a world that is... Um, yeah, I guess the improvisation world has a bit of a stigma about it in some senses. And then in, in other ways, when you start to look at actually what skills you need, it's fascinating. Mm. Oli, did you um, have something to add to that? I was just going to say, yeah, I totally agree. And it's really fascinating to hear about other areas having this stigma around improvisation because it doesn't exist in jazz, but I know it does exist. Mm. And probably even in, when we're writing for film and TV, as you can imagine, maybe not directors, but like executives might be kind of anxious at the thought of, of using the word improvisation but like for me that's when when I'm truly improvising and like Roger was saying when I'm doing something like that example with Liam Noble where there was no preparation we deliberately didn't say anything before we performed we had no idea what was going to happen there was no tonal center or time signature to go we just we just went and there's this state of being as a musician when you're when you're in that kind of flow as an improviser where you feel completely free and uninhibited and that's it's like a really magical place and for me that's what I'm always trying as a film composer or a media composer I'm trying to like harness that especially with that initial 
moment, like Hannah was saying, of like that one chord sequence or that one thing that you suddenly hold on to and then that becomes the whole score because I think that's, it's a really difficult thing to just let everything else go and focus on this one unique idea that has so much like truth and integrity to it because it's your honest reaction. And when we've got deadlines and we've got oh, reels coming in that are changing and scenes that are, you know, have kind of crazy sound effects or temporary ADR, it's, it's not like a perfect situation to work in, but you have to just try and find this like flow state of, of improvising and kind of truthfulness as a musician to go with. But um, yeah, for me, it's very much like the, what I aspire to, to do rather than anything that, that there should be a stigma around. It's like my, my main goal. Roger, did you have something? That you yeah, did? I was just thinking that there's, there's something uh, to me that makes an awful lot of sense about m maybe how people think scientifically as well, because um, in a way with one, it, with one way of functioning, you, you can be thinking in detail about something that has clear edges and you're thinking within boundaries about a particular problem, say. But I think that there's a different way of thinking, well, certainly from my experience, which involves kind of letting go and, and Ollie, when you were talking about that sense of flow, you, you know, le letting those boundaries become porous so that ideas from outside that narrow field can come in and start, um, start mixing, mixing in. And so, in, in my case, I find that, you know, these insights from magicians and puppeteers and you know, musicians, all, all the people I was talking about earlier, that they, they work in that kind of way because, because you have to kind of free up what you're thinking about a bit and, and open it up to being, um, to connections from apparently completely unrelated areas. Um, which is why I think the idea of looking at performance rather than performance of, uh, I mean, the, the performance is normally, it's normally defined, I think, by its musical performance or its sporting performance or its medical performance or whatever it is. But actually, if you just look at the performance, then that, the idea of performance, then that makes those boundaries become smudgy and perhaps even dissolve a bit. And I think that's what was happening with the conversations with Ollie, I think, from my point of view, certainly, because it made me sort of stop focusing on a particular issue, but think more generally about points of connection. Mm -hmm. And and I, I imagine that, well, I, I don't know because it's not my field, but I, I imagine that if your if your composition work is is in film and television and media and things like that, where there are many different sort of many different people and their perspectives coming into the picture maybe there's some of that sort of interfusion that you have to do that requires a, a relaxed mind and and not too many barriers i don't know it, 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 i'm not sure if that's making any sense to the musicians but it it occurred to me that that might happen it certainly does happen in the world of science i think um, one of the things actually that um, I was listening to a conversation that you had, Roger, um, and you were talking about how with expertise comes the ability to be able to see a whole procedure as as in the as the long as the sort of the bigger picture, um, rather than um, when you start, first start out as a surgeon and you kind of see it as one small procedure after another, and then as you sort of progress in the career, your your ability to be able to see it actually as one big procedure. Um, with an end goal um, that that becomes more sort of prevalent in your in your work and that really reminded me of of sort of how composers that I mean the same sort of thing happens with composers I think when you first start out you're learning you know the, the, the jigsaw puzzle of putting a piece together and then as you sort of progress and hone your your craft um, you're able to I think take a step back slightly and be able to see it as one you know, larger composition and um, and be able to sort of see it, the bigger picture. I don't know. Would you agree with that, Hannah? Yeah, definitely. It, it's really interesting because when I was at university, I ended up doing a lot of musical theatre and teaching a lot of the actors and dancers singing. And I, I ended up kind of when I left, one of the things I did was work with some amateur dramatics and things. And I, I kind of was like, oh, this is no, you know, this is no relation to what I want to do. And then now like drawing on all those things and especially the psychology behind things and the way people work, working in a team, like the community, the constant as a composer and uh, you're constantly dealing with everybody else's, the director's feelings, the exec producers, the producers, 
and you're trying to kind of juggle all this whilst also trying to put your own artistic intention in. Um, there's so much about team play and there's so much about how much you take and you leave and, and music wise as well. Like you have to not be precious about certain things. So, um, but yeah, so it, yeah, you find that the past just all, all of a sudden just goes straight in and it, it's a really magical experience actually. Um, I don't know how you feel about that, Holly, Holly if like if that's something that you found or have you like, did you have experience of drama and theatre before? Um, no, I'm not at all, really. Um, I, I guess I've always, I've always loved film music ever since I was a kid and, and, and film, I always said before I kind of worked in it, film was always my like non-musical escape, my hobby. So like the idea of storytelling was always, always very important to me. Um, and I guess my first album was kind of, um, it did tell the story of that time. I didn't write each piece to represent one particular memory or like scenario I was going through but listening back to it now it, it totally did it was like each song was like a little photograph so I do try and take that that kind of storytelling approach which I, I didn't intend to kind of harness in my compositions and and obviously it directly translates into film scoring but like the thing about um not seeing things um is it micro and think of a macro is that the term I, I try and I try and think about that all the time because that's when I'm listening to a film score that really resonates with me. It really feels like there's an overarching musical story that's being told, and it's usually, or I can be at least, talking about an element of the plot that the script or the performances and the actors can't actually communicate. It's this overarching story, um, and it's that's when I think it really resonates. It's not just scoring scene by scene. It's the music's got like a, a true voice to it. And that's something that I, I always try and think about when I'm starting something. And it's, it was funny because I obviously, like most of most composers, I bet started doing lots of short films of various lengths. Some of them only a couple of minutes. So that's, it's not really possible. Sometimes all you've got is one piece of music, in which case that's great. But sometimes when it's like a 20 minute short, it's not really possible to tell like a, a huge musical uh, arc. So you've got to kind of do it scene by scene. And then you learn how you can start to piece that together into one long form kind of, musical journey and musical story but yeah I think working with other people and especially with like directors who who perhaps have written their own features or, or shorts and stuff they have a real insight into the writing process and then you get to learn more about that and then if you once you work with editors and you start to understand that they work it does it does affect the way that you the way that you operate not necessarily the way you compose but the way that all the other things that we have to do as composers um, influence our work so like seeing the other the other kind of cogs in the machine definitely definitely influences it. Yeah, well, when you were talking about storytelling, it made me think about um, when I was a GP, actually, because um, that was after I'd been a surgeon. As I said, I, I did that for quite a number of years as a GP. And, and I think at first I thought of that work as, as, as sort of having stored up loads of facts and bits of medical knowledge, and then I'd apply them in a particular, uh, for a particular person, you know, to, to find out what was wrong and treat them. But actually, the more I did it, the more I realised that what I was doing was trying to capture somebody else's story um, and trying in 10 minutes or whatever it was to get a sense of what that person was really trying to say and what the issue was for them and that was very much about and it was only after we'd after that had happened and we, we had a shared understanding of what the issue was that we could then start to think about what to do about it and, and then I could sort of um, bring in my medical knowledge when it was relevant which it was quite a lot of the time but quite a lot of the time it wasn't because because people would come with all sorts of problems and they weren't always directly medical ones they were to do with other aspects of their life very often and so I, I, I came to think of the these consultations as a kind of uh, again a, a sort of improvised but also a, a, a storytelling uh, encounter where my job was really to try and crystallize what that story was for that person at that time and link it or see how it, how it merged with the story that I needed to tell, which was, could it be this disease? Could it be that? What do we need to do? What happens next? Um, and, and, and this sort of bringing together different, different stories, I thought was quite an interesting way of looking at it. And I, I, I wondered, you know, you've been talking about the various stories that you, that you need to, that you need to juggle with your your own and the, the one that you're developing but also the stories of the 
uh, of the film companies and the executives and all, all that kind of thing. And I, I wonder whether there's something about about this interweaving of stories to come up with a with a uh, a narrative that makes sense to some extent to everybody, although a different sense to everybody. Mm. And and whether again that's a characteristic of um, perhaps of, of composing. I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, there is a compositional element in, in medical practice, I think, towards coming up with something that, that works as, a, as a, uh, a sort of framing or a way of understanding that particular issue, which, which, which isn't just gathering information and putting it into preconceived pigeonholes. It's something that is in, it involves a synthesis and a creative process in coming up collaboratively with a, a version or an account that makes sense. And I, I just wonder whether there are ideas there that resonate with, with the musicians in the room. Yeah, there's, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it's, I, I guess it's the, the, the skill of listening as well and being able to absorb what is going around and kind of putting an ego aside in order to tell a story or to tell a, a, a greater a greater good if you know what I mean I sub, um, the, I, I guess that sometimes I, I find that when especially going from being an artist to a composer it's a different headspace and I and I don't know how to describe that but there's it's kind of like one side of your brain is the kind of the 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 more ego artist self and then the other side is the composing making sure that performers are happy, the, everybody else, the conductor's happy. And, and it's sometimes when, um, especially for me, if I'm like working on an album and then I have something else to do, I, it's really hard to switch a brain over. Like it almost, you almost need a couple of weeks off in between just to kind of just go, okay, right, this is now for me. And now this is, it's like you're switching on that ear again to listen to everybody else and, and how, how you can adapt to that. Um, I don't know how that works scientifically, but <laughs> that's how, that's how it feels. But I guess the, the the side of story, I do a lot of work for Radio Three and presenting on night tracks. And actually, the the one thing that I find the most exciting and the most interesting is when people send in music, but they have a story that goes with it. So because then you've got something to talk about, everyone's got something to relate to. It creates a, a nicer community within the listening experience. And I guess one of the things I'd love to know, Roger, at some point on this chat is actually, do you listen to music or were you listening to music when you were doing surgery as well? And if so, what? <laughs> um, well, I, uh, yeah, no, I didn't used to listen to, to music when I was uh, operating because I found it distracting. I know a lot of people do, but I ended up listening to the music rather than <laughs> focusing on what I was doing sometimes. So, so I, I'm, I, I do listen to a lot of music. I particularly like um, Baroque music and jazz. So, you know, sort of different, different um, approaches. Um, but I, I think it's a very interesting one about, about music as a, as a component of something else like operating. I know what, what some of my, one of my colleagues and, and I did, did quite a lot of work looking at how surgeons use music in the operating theatre, for instance. Um, and there's a very wide, um, it's a very wide range. Um, some surgeons nowadays listen to pretty loud um, rock music or all kinds of music. Other people want complete silence. Other people want sort of contemplative um, classical music, all sorts of things. But I think one of the interesting things that came out of that, that piece of work that we did was that in a complex environment like the operating theatre, you have different people doing different things at different times. Um, and the, the, the power relations, the power dynamics of the operating theatre generally mean that the people who choose the music are the surgeons. Um, and so one of the things that came out of this study was that if you take a, an ordinary operation where there, there's a you know the beginning and then there's usually a difficult bit in the middle and then when 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 everything's settled down and the surgeons are closing the patient up that's quite a relaxing time for the surgeons and they would very often ask for the volume of the music to be turned up but that was exactly the time when the scrub nurses would have to be doing the critical procedure of counting in and counting out all the swabs and the instruments to make sure that everything was correct 
And particularly if you had people, for instance, who had hearing difficulties or the acoustics in the operating theatre were bad or whatever, there could be real problems because uh, one set of people wanted one kind of uh, oral, one, 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 one sort of kind of sound world. Other people wanted a different kind of sound world. And I just wondered whether this, this, whole, this whole question of how we make that, make that evident and negotiate and sort out whose, whose wishes are being met and, and how, the, how that balance is struck. I thought it was a, a really interesting one. And I guess you must have that all the time in musical ensembles and, and I suppose composing too. Well, it's, it's something that actually that I really struggled with when I first started to become a media composer because when you're writing for yourself, you are, especially if you're self-producing it, you are, you're the boss. So it, it's done when you decide it's done or when you run out of time. Um, and it's so much more of a collaborative or can be so much more of a collaborative process working with a director or something because you are trying to sometimes get inside their heads or in the character's head. And uh, yeah, it's, def it's something that I struggle with. And I would be interested to ask Hannah because I personally, when I, as an, when I write as an artist, because it's especially because it's instrumental, I don't, um, I'm trying to write from my point of view, but, but kind of from a very, honest place and not thinking about getting inside a character or like imagining I know lots of storytellers and songwriters would kind of imagine a scenario or a character and, and write a story a, a song around that kind of almost like you're an actor in your own play whereas I I was never able to do that so I always tried to just write whatever I did at the time so then when I'm writing for film and tv I'm very much trying to almost like act like in a performance and get inside that headspace and I happen to be working on loads of really dark films and programs at the moment. And like, I, if I've been working all day on a scene of like somebody getting like suffocated or something, like I'll finish for the day and my wife will just be, look at me like, what have you been through? But like, I really try and internalize that whole, that whole story. And like, that's, that's how I get into music. I kind of almost wish that as an artist, I was also able to channel that because it's a really exciting journey. And I found actually since trying, I've been trying to write a new album, recently and I've really struggled because I'm now so used to working kind of with somebody else collaboratively to tell a story or within parameters or like the music needs to have these orchestral elements because we decided at the beginning so now when I have no rules no limitations you'd think that would be really freeing and actually I'm really struggling because I have way too much of kind of a headspace around me that I can go into and no direction and it's I have to just try and harness I guess that um that authority back to myself to say this is it but Hannah do you when you write for your artist self do you get into that do you kind of like tell a story that you're making up or what yeah do you do? I totally feel you <laughs> it's it's like it's really hard like I don't think a lot of people realize the difference in the brain they think oh you can just write another piece but exactly when you take away the pressures or the story or the narrative I, I, I do find I have to make up my own narrative because I, I kind of flounder sleep go anywhere then I get dragged into my own self perpetuating doubt and insecurities and you know like I was composing for a piece I'm doing a piece for the para orchestra in Bristol they integrate disabled and non-disabled musicians and they basically just said take any instrument you want we'll, ha we'll work with anything and those like boundaries are just endless but uh, my software stopped working when I updated my computer two weeks ago. And because of that, I stopped composing because <laughs> I just can't handle the kind of like the pressure of like not having this direction and, and the site, but going back to kind of the characters and the, the psychology of, I, I find, yeah, I, I mean, the TV show I've just finished, um, it's kind of like a psychological thriller and I would spend most days like writing this, horrific kind of like sounds and then I live by a marina and at night if it's really really windy when the only chance I would have to go for a walk is the, these like horror sounds of like the wind blowing through and the mass clanking and like you're just in this state of like oh my god what's coming what's happening <laughs> until you get through it and you got to the end of the show um but yeah I guess that kind of delving into the, the psychosis of somebody and what they are doing is for me the exciting part and it's not just like here's a story and I'm going to tell it with emotive music it's more to do with the subtleties and and finding that but actually going back to 
having to now write an album for this orchestra, I, I find that the music is, I don't know whether it's because of the state that we're in right now, but the music is so kind of calming and like the complete opposite to everything else. It's just, it's, it's almost as if like my soul just needed a little bit of a rest. And so the music that's coming out is quite secular and even quite renaissance in, in, in that aspect, which I never expected. So actually that freedom again, and that improvisation is starting to come out just from the struggle or the, the kind of that boundary. So it's a different boundary. It's not this boundary, it's this boundary. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> I'm hoping that I come out of, because yeah, I would deliver in this film in a couple of weeks, and I'm hoping then I just can do like some like ambient, lovely, like relaxing album. But it's funny you're saying about like walking around and hearing those sounds that you then associate with the world you've just been making it, because I, I spend quite a lot of time doing like kind of sound manipulation and, and creating my own sounds for stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm not very good with external noise, unexpected noise. I get really irritated by it. And there was, they were doing the, redoing the pavement at the end of my street and it was really loud drills and I was really grinding my gears. And so I went out onto the street and recorded it on my iPhone because it was really interesting. And then I made it into this contact instrument for this film for this look for like the really horrible bits like bit through distortion pedals. And it's, it's like the most perfect sound. So I'm learning to try and like use those annoy previous annoyances to, uh, to my benefit sometimes. Um, I wanted to just um, circle back to Roger, and um, I know that you do a lot of um, a lot of work around um, the the notion of engagement. Um, and um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna quote you to yourself here, which is probably very annoying. But I really I really liked this um, this just this little excerpt that I read from one of your I think one of your essays. But it says traditional approaches to public engagement think in terms of transmission of information from experts to non-experts. My colleagues and I have been developing a different model which assumes everyone who takes part has expertise, though of different kinds. The expertise of being a surgeon may be different from the expertise of being a patient, but effective engagement can result in a reciprocal illumination for all who take part. And that really resonated with me because um, I think, I mean that, that's so similar to what to the job of a composer because everything that you do I think you have to be constantly considering what what your audience is gonna how they're going to receive it you're thinking about all the experts that are involved in creating that music all the musicians um, and 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 like we were saying before you know it's it's very much sort of a team effort um, I don't I don't know what what's your what are your thoughts on that Roger well, I mean, this idea of reciprocal illumination is, is something that I developed with a, a, a colleague of mine called Gunter Kress, who tragically died last year. But um, the, the idea that, that engagement, I mean, public engagement, which is, I think, often seen as, as a, a sort of eminent scientist telling people stuff. Um, it seems to me that engagement implies a, a, a to and fro process. Uh, and this idea of reciprocal illumination is something that that I think is really important because if you're if you're explaining something about your world to other people then you need to be as open I think to their response to you as you hope they will be to your response to them if I've got that the right way around you know what I mean it's, it's a sort of two-way process and, and and so this involves a sense I think of partnership of people being there together to to jointly make sense of what's happening and to try and, and enrich it and I guess there must be parallels with musical performance and audiences. There certainly are with clinicians and patients. There certainly are with, with uh, I mean, the stuff that we were talking about earlier with Ollie and the brain surgery in the, in the cockpit in the London Jazz Festival, I saw very much as, a, as a, um, a process of bringing people together to share perspectives. And whenever we've done that with my colleagues, there have been usually people from the from the audience people sort of participating who've who've shared their experiences of what it is to be in some way involved in medical processes as a patient or a parent or a child of a, a patient all, 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 all sorts of different things and unless we take all those together take take them into account and put them together and make sense of them in a sense of partnership rather than that transmission you mentioned i think we we are in danger of missing a trick um, but it, it does require, I think, a bit of sort of recalibrating because the, the, the sort of traditional ways that certainly public engagement activities are done are very often still 
on that transmission model. And I think the same thing goes for many other areas. I mean, education is the same. There is still a very strong traditional model, which, which sometimes works, but sometimes doesn't, of one person standing up and lots of other people sitting down and being quiet and listening. And, you know, there, there are all sorts of areas in which this idea of a, a partnership with others who are taking part that, that, that really works in terms of changing everybody's perception of it, I think is, is very important. And a lot of the work that I've done with the with the uh, other performers I mentioned, the magicians and the musicians and various other people, have, have, made, have made me think more and more that that's the case. I think as well, it, it's, there's sometimes, when somebody's hired you for your expertise, you're tempted to kind of keep this illusion up that what, you, that what happens behind the closed door is, is very mysterious. Um, and actually, I totally agree with this idea of, of of opening those previously closed doors, like Roger, you do so amazingly with, with engagement with the surgical demonstrations is, is really important because people understand what, what goes on and they see like the human level. And like from, a, I know that from uh, my experience as a media composer, particularly it seems to be in like commer advertisement and commercials. I think one of the things that leads to so much um, anxiety for, for composers and so many kind of mental health problems is that, there isn't an understanding but for what actually goes on, what the process is like to make a piece of music to picture and with edits and stuff. And they, especially when it comes to how much time it takes to do stuff, but, but just generally what goes into it. And if we, if we could be a bit more open as, as uh, our community, but ever, generally as other communities about what it takes and, and kind of the intricacies that go on, it's just going to lead for a more open dialogue and everybody's going to be in a better place for it because there's that understanding and it doesn't just go for our communities like you were saying Roger there's, it goes across all sorts of industries and and work types but it, I think it's it's such an important thing that we all need to do more of for sure. Yeah and I think it's an it's a it's a sort of complementary thing I mean it's not I think it's it's not a question of diminishing the value or undervaluing the expertise that particular experts have, have developed. I think it's saying that there are other kinds of expertise that are equally important and they need to come together. And so it's, it's not about, uh, I, I don't know, uh, saying that the composers or musicians or surgeons are, 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 are less skilled than they actually are or diminishing that at all. No, 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 it's much more about saying that these other perspectives like being a patient, like being an audience member, are also bring richness and a different kind of understanding. But in order for that to work, you have to establish a relationship of trust, I think. And, and Hannah, I'd, I'd be interested because I, I know you, 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 you deal with all sorts of stuff, you know, complicated electronic instruments and loads of stuff. And, and so presumably when people encounter your work, they don't see any of that. They, they, they hear what you produce, but, but maybe don't have an insight into how complex the process is that you go through. And I wonder what you felt about this business of, of sort of sharing insights into not only what you're doing to create things, but how they land with people who hear them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's a really interesting thing. There's kind of two things that have happened, particularly lockdown. We've started talking a lot more about these things and the, the trust and the, the communication between people, especially between um, artist to artist and different genres of music. Um, it's been really enlightening and it's, it's kind of been needed because sometimes you feel like you're such in a world on your own. But I guess going back to performance and how that relates, um, the usually like, I prefer like just on a practical level, level not to use a laptop on stage because I feel that that kind of like organicness and that energy and that passion in the music and how it's created and seen takes an audience on a journey via itself if you can see that that somebody is playing a synthesizer and having to manipulate that by hand rather than just pressing a button and um i guess for me when when we did the brass band um concerts the most kind of like enlightening thing about that was that you know there was the synthesizers but then you had like a 30 piece brass band and and that kind of breathing organic machine in itself it was just incredible like it was it created a sound that was like this sound that you could not 
you can't describe on a record. You had to have an audience there that would understand that that sound that was coming from a different place. And, and you know, like you, you know, you got the shivers down your, your spine, like just because it, all of a sudden everyone took a breath and then this well of sound just comes at you. Um, and that for me, I suppose generated a lot of trust with a lot of the people that I sell music with and share music online and talk with because they also experienced something that meant that we all grew as well. So it wasn't just like, okay, here's a singer and she's singing and she's playing a bit of keyboards. It was more about that kind of, that, um, that well. So I've always taken that, that element of, the, the last record I did was with a poet and I made sure that everything was analog just because it, for me, it feels good for the audience. It feels good. Like, you know, sometimes when things go wrong, you get that sense of joy because everybody's in on it together. Um, and, I, and I guess that's something that I take as a performance element um, and enjoy that because then you all go on a journey together and that's, that's what you want from a live performance. You don't want to just be blasted. Well, I don't anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask the, the composers, if I may, something that I've often wondered about, which is, um, do, do you, I'm, I'm thinking about, you, you were saying about things going wrong sometimes, or, or the, the sort of sense of insecurity sometimes that we all have. When, when people commission you to, to compose something, or you set out to compose something, I mean, does it ever happen that you wonder whether you're going to be able to, or... Or, or whether you'll have the inspiration you need to do it, or I mean, I find that was writing, uh, you know, writing words sometimes. Um, but I just wonder if, if, if in the world of, of, of music, I suppose, like 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 painting, is there a sense sometimes that you're not sure whether you're going to be able to come up with the ideas that you need, particularly if there's a, a short deadline? Or I've, I've personally never done a project where I haven't had a little mini meltdown before I've started. And my wife makes fun of me now because every time I start a new film, I go like, oh, I, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have said yes to this. I don't think I should do it. She goes, do this every time. But I, I think it's actually quite an important thing. I mean, it could be something I've done a hundred times before and I still don't know that I can do it. It can literally be like orchestrating something. And I think like, oh, I can't even remember how to orchestrate. And I did this last week. But I think it's, it's, I think it's an important part of the process. I know it is for me anyway. Um, of just, it's like you're starting from scratch on an emotional level. You're never taking like this ego from the last thing I did that was really good and I'm just gonna do that again. You're always starting from the bottom and having to, it's tough because you're having to like emotionally build yourself up and build up your confidence. But um, again, maybe being stripped down to nothing is a good way to like get back to that heart of your true musical voice because you haven't got anything attached or weighting it down that you're just kind of having to have your first reactions. I don't know what you find, Hannah, but I certainly feel that way. Yeah, uh, the fear every time. But I, I kind of liken it to like when you walk on stage and you have that adrenaline and nervousness and you know the kind of common thing of like, well, when you stop feeling those butterflies and nerves, you know that you shouldn't be doing that or you maybe you're, you're not going to bring that excitement that you want to have. Um, but yeah, this, the, the fear and the, the psychological kind of battle to go towards something but it's interesting um and i'd like to know roger what what techniques you might use if you are faced with something is because like for me the kind of the only way to battle that is maybe to walk over into a different room and play the piano and just sit and play something that is completely non-related and usually that answers the question of what i'm trying to find or a melody or or an idea it, or like going for a walk it, like lately as well just that kind of different air and different um it just really helps with mental well-being particularly um and it's been kind of like a revelatory idea that you just go for a walk and it helps <laughs> yeah I, I certainly found that i mean I'm, I'm sure we all have but uh you know going for walks in the park we're very lucky we, we live quite near a park in london and and that's been um i think that that brings a whole completely different when i when i feel i'm getting closed in and i can't think of what i want to think about or or i'm just ideas aren't flowing then then having a complete change i find a physical change makes a big difference having a shower as well standing under hot water i find some of my um the ideas that have turned out to be most 
fruitful in the end have, have come from being in a different environment physically like that um, and I've, I've spoken I've heard a lot of other people say that, that that they find things you know it might be going swimming or it might be this or it might be that but 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 changing the physical environment is can be it can be very Im important but the other thing I was thinking about was that when I when I became a GP actually I, I read a, a book that really influenced me a lot by a, a a GP called Roger Neighbour, who wrote about the consultation as not not the medical content of the consultation with the patient, but the process uh, and the stages that you might go through. Um, and one of the things he pointed out was the need uh, to to sort of take soundings and respond to your own emotional state, because particularly in general practice at that time, you'd see. 30 or 35 patients in a, in a morning surgery, lots and lots and lots of them. And, and these things could build up inside you. You know, you'd be dealing with people who were seriously ill or very anxious or angry or whatever. And if you didn't acknowledge that, you could find that stuff from one consultation could spill over into the next one. And so this idea of taking just a moment before you saw the next person or I guess gave the next part of your performance or whatever to, 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 to think about what was going on inside you and maybe just to open the window and have a breath or, or just sort of shake your arms or, or go and have a cup of coffee or have a chat with something but that, that, that need to deliberately um, see, take stock of how you were feeling inside because that's I think surprisingly easy to overlook until it all builds up and then you find at the end of the day that you, you're not feeling well or, or things go, um, go, go awry in some way. And I thought that was really powerful because I think that this, I think it was, uh, this, this book I read was, was years ahead of its time. I think now people are becoming much more aware of well-being and the need to, to sort of um, look after oneself. But, but I think still there is a need to do that, certainly in, in the, the kind of work that I do. And I, I wondered whether you know, as composers and performers, you also felt that need to just to, to sort of check in with how you're feeling inside as well as how you appear from the outside. I think, yeah, that thing of, of yeah, totally. And, and the idea of being too much in your head, whether that's um, that you're struggling at the start of a project or, or it, it also is the same with like performance anxiety and, and when you're freezing on stage, it's exactly the same process. But this idea we have, and I don't know if it's a British keep calm, carry on and just ignore the bad things mentality, but the idea that when you have those like thoughts of self-doubt to just bottle them down and ignore them, especially when with writer's block, that, that can actually just cause you much more mental harm than if you stop and just think like, okay, I'm struggling with this because maybe I'm approaching it from the wrong standpoint. Maybe I'm trying to write this on the piano where actually it wants to be like a weird synthy thing as a starting point. And with, I've never personally really deal dealt much with performance anxiety but I've had lots of friends who who do and again that idea of just like oh I'm scared to go on stage so just ignore it and just and just do it that works for some people but actually if you can think like if you can think through the process of I'm probably nervous because if I'm a singer I'm gonna forget the lyrics or I'm nervous because last time I used the laptop like it just froze and you know if you're thinking about the technical things and then you it's easier to kind of rationalize them and think okay well it's not going to go wrong because I updated my software or I've got the lyrics taped to the floor anyway and yeah from a composer point of view you think well it's fine I've got all these crazy bits of audio in a folder let me just drop one of those in and see if that works and that kickstarts it so I think it's definitely a really valuable thing of, of being able to to get in touch with that the, the kind of inner voice and the inner demon and just think about what what it is why it's there what it is and how you can take like a positive step to addressing that rather than just trying to bottle it up. I think, um, I think you make a really good point there, Ollie. And I think, um, I think the root of a lot of anxiety across all disciplines um, is sort of the unknown versus the known. And I think when you've got more of the unknown, that's what causes anxiety because it's unpredictable. Um, it goes back to improvisation. Um, you know, and it, you, you don't know what's going to happen and that can cause anxiety. And I think you're right. If you can sit, if you can sit down and say, right, what are the things that I do know? And what are the things that, um, I know are going to happen and I know I can do and are going to go right. I think that is definitely, um, a really good tactic to be able to, 
um, combat that sort of anxiety over the unknown that um, that you will get as a performer and as a composer um, and as a and as a surgeon. <laughs> Um, well, I think we are um, coming up to the end of our conversation. Um, it's been really, really interesting to talk to you all um, and um, some really great insights into um, lots of different things. Um, and thank you all for um, joining us today.